Yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we're going through the slides. He also gave, uh, in addition to the slides and the uh, and the PDF file, he gave us a reference, uh, chapter 11 in the the deep learning book. Um, it's a section on practical methodology, and I think they allow you to copy it. So um, you don't have to have the deep learning book. They they give you that that chapter, and it's about um, it looks like about 20 pages of, of stuff. Probably interesting to read. I haven't gone through it yet, but I probably would like to. Um, have anybody seen this a deep learning book um, by Ian Goodfellow and Yasha Benjo and another co-author? Um, it's chapter 11 from this book. All right, um, so let's go through this. Uh, before we do, are there does anybody want to have anything to say or any comments, things they want to share? Yes, no? No, OK. Um, all right, so let's see. You just go through uh, their grading policy and stuff, which is not relevant to us. Um, but they have a, they have a either, you can choose a, a custom project uh, which is something of your own design, or you can work on the default project, the, the squad answering, qu squad question answering. Um, Stanford, it's a, it's a problem that, you know, it, it's a way to evaluate question answering systems, the squad thing. It's the Stanford question answering something or other. Um, and so the question, the problem is basically uh, reading some document and then answering a question about it. And they re recommend working in teams of one through three. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Stanford Squad, Stanford Question Answering Data Set. So that's the, that's the thing. Um, and there's a reference here. Um, and apparently the Squad 2.0, this is 2019, the Squad 2. Point, squad 1.1 has only questions that have answers, and Squad 2.0 has includes questions that have no answers, uh, un unanswerable questions, um, and it's harder. Um, and so they say the option is to do either Squad 1.1 or Squad 2.0. Um, and they're going to talk about that in the actual, in, actually, in the next next week's lecture, in, the, in our next lecture that we're going to cover next weekend. Um, okay, so. Uh, he gives reasons why you might want to choose the default project if you don't have a lot of experience and so on. Um, and he ends up concluding that it's better to do the default project than to, to, to do a good job on the default project than to do a not so good job on some custom project that you haven't really been able to flesh out. Uh, let's see. And so in this, in today's lecture, they actually do cover some material. Um, they cover, you know, guidelines for working out on these projects, but they also do a little bit of a review of the, um, a sort of an interesting review of the GRU and LSTMs that we saw in previous, uh, in one of the previous uh, lectures. So let's see, reasons for choosing project uh, grading. One of the things that um, he suggests, which is good for anybody doing a project, is to have a is to have uh, milestones, like at least a halfway point milestone. When you define the task, you uh, set yourself something that you should have accomplished by the by the middle of the you know of the baseline period that you're supposed to work on it. So that's uh, a good a good pointer. He talks about two different kind of problems. One is where you start out with some kind of a, a technical approach and you you, you find a, pl which is, you know, he ca calls a hammer, and then you look for uh, places to use it, you know, places to pound in the nails. The other kind of project is uh, sort of a, that's kind of like a top-down approach. You start with some, you know, technical approach that you've learned, you know, like LSTMs or GRUs or some, some kind of network, um, and look for problems to solve with. And the other problem is, is the bottom-up approach where you, start with some kind of a domain problem of interest and try to figure out what are the right technical approaches 
uh, and maybe find some better technical approaches that are currently used. So that's the kind of problem he calls the nails problem. But um, I also look at it as a bottom up kind of problem where you, you see a problem uh, and that needs to be solved and then you work from there to figure out the best way to solve it. Um, let's see. He gives you sort of a list of kinds of projects. Um, I guess it's an incre increasing order of difficulty, maybe. So this is kind of like a basic project. You find some task of interest and figure out how to solve it using an uh, existing approach. Um, that's the bottom-up problem that he talked about. And here's the top-down problem where you implement some complex um, neural network architecture, and then you demonstrate its performance on some data. Um, that's maybe a bit harder. Um, then you, even harder, you could come up with a new variant of that um, model and explore how it, explore its success empirically. And then the analysis project where you uh, do some kind of a deep analysis, you de deep, deep analysis of the way a model behaves. Um, and uh, it's not just solving the, a problem, but it's analyzing a model, figuring out what's good or what's bad about that problem and uh, that that model and and how um, and how it can fail and and how how it can be good. And then he actually demonstrates one example of a rare theoretical project, which is the hardest kind. Um, show some non some interesting non-trivial properties of a model type data or data representation. And then he gives some kind of a he gives an example of some uh, one of his students. Um, she explored, I forget what the, the model was, but she actually implemented this model that was <clears throat> given in a paper and hadn't been implemented in public in, in, public in, any, uh, in any way before. And she figured out how to implement it and, and do a good job with it. So that's kind of like the hardest kind of project. Oh, let's see. Oh, and here it gives them some examples of some successful projects from before. Some, some guys built a uh, a Shakespearean sonnet generator that did a not too bad job of generating text that looks like it might come from Shakespeare's son sonnets. And then here's the uh, architecture of the model they built to do it. Um, anyway, so that's one. Um, this is the one, and, and I guess she was a graduate student. This is the one who implemented this new architecture called uh, differentiable neural computers, which I don't know what that is. Um, she was able to implement it and get and get reasonable performance of it. And she actually published a paper uh, for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then, and then these guys also published a conference. Uh, I don't know if he said anything about her publishing a paper. I think she did. But anyway, he, <clears throat> he then these two guys made a project where they actually did publish a, uh, a paper at a, at a famous conference. Um, ICLR, um, I forget what it's, what that is, learning representation, something like that. Um, it's one of the big um, neural network conferences that they run every year. I think it just finished recently. Let's see. Uh, they actually figured out ways to improve um, <coughs> RNNN for language models. Um, and they did two different kinds of improvements. Um, one was was uh, figuring uh, adding to adding an additional loss term to to, to the traditional cross entropy loss term that um, takes advantage of the um, similarity between the target and the other words. So uh, the target word and, and other words. So that if you're looking for a target word and uh, and you. You, you're given a, a source word, and you're looking for a target word, and there are other words. You, you kind of take a look at the embeddings of the source word and the target word, and and you realize that that there are other words whose embedding vectors are near the target word, and so you kind of take that into account as well. Um, and it, he actually found better performance with that. They actually found better performance with that loss function, and. Let's see, they also did something to achieve a large reduction in the number of free parameters um, and, and still improving. Um, not sure how they, let's see, minimizing. So the one thing they did was they 
uh, tweaked the uh, the loss loss function to take into account the um, similarity between the target and the source word. Um, and I don't know what the other thing they implemented was, but there were two things they did, and uh, they achieved better performance um, with a smaller model. Um, and then this guy um, did some kind of a project where instead of using 32-bit uh, full precision word vectors, they used um, four bits to represent each vector. And um, the idea was to, was to create something that they could use on a cell phone. And they actually uh, got that working. And, um, and they found that it worked surprisingly well. And one of the reasons that he gave that, um, the, that um, what's his name, um, Christopher Manning gave, the, the teacher gave, was that by going to quantized word vectors, that is, uh, shrinking the number of bits that, you use, that you're allowed to use uh, from 32 to something like a few, um, they got some kind of a regularization. Um, they got some improvement partially from regularization. Uh, and that, that's common when you use, uh, you remember in, in fast AI, when we went from, he did the um, mixed precision training and he used um, 16 bits uh, for part of the training. And they found, again, they found some improvement because of regularization because 16 bits kind of introduces some error. It kind of messes up your, your data a little bit, your data and models a little bit. And, and that's what regularization, that's kind of the hallmark of regularization. It kind of kicks your model a little bit and, and shakes it up and, uh, and introduces errors. And in the long run, that helps you to not overfit. So anyway. OK, so he says, where do you start when you're trying to find a data set for an NLP project? And he gives a number of sources. There's, there's, a, there's actually a lot. And probably in 2020, we would do well to do a new, fresh search of NLP data, because maybe there's more uh, data sets on the horizon than there were in 2019. But he gives this website, um, which is antho ACL Anthology for NLP Papers. Um, it's actually a website. Um, it looks at uh, online proceedings of major ML conferences. NeurIPS is one. Um, ICML, which is actually today's the last day of it. Um, it's been going on all week. And ICLR, this is the other one. Um, International Conference, I think International Conference of Machine Learning, International Conference of Learning Representation, something like that. Um, the other option is to look at past um, projects, which they have on the class website. And then, uh, of course, for looking at papers, you can look at um, archive.org, uh, preprint servers. Um, so that's kind of looking for papers, looking for papers to read to get ideas. Uh, but then he says, also, you could look for an interesting problem in the world that needs solution. You know, there have been a lot of a lot of things done on, on Kaggle. Like, for example, uh, uh, they had some kind of a fake news detection kind of a contest. There has been a lot of contests lately on Kaggle that involve NLP. Um, there's also this uh, website created by um, Andre Karpathy, who, invented, who actually started the CS231N course, which uh, is the is similar, it's sort of a follow-on for this course, or maybe a parallel course that one could take um, that involves um, computer vision. Um, and this one, you can, you can get into this site, and it'll, it'll actually query you for which papers you're interested in, and then it'll start suggesting papers that are along those lines. So it's a good way to get uh, paper suggestions. Once it learns what kind of stuff you're interested in, then it uh, makes recommendations for which papers you might you might usefully read. Um, by the way, CS two thirty one N is another course that we might consider teaching uh, to consider um, forming a study group for after we finish this one because actually some people have already suggested that they would like to do that. Um, I, I'd like to do it for sure. Um, so that's something to keep in mind for later. Uh, let's see. Um, there's this other site that. Uh, people that people have used, um, and it was new in 2019. It's called Papers with Code, um, and they 
the state of the art, you can look at state of the art um, papers and techniques for for many different areas of of machine learning. Um, let's go to this website and just to have a look at it. Um, papers with code, state of the art. Let's see. Um, paper, papers with. Uh, let's see. Paperswithcode.com. Is it paperswithcode.com or? Let me see. That's this one. Um, yeah, it is paperswithcode.com. So we're at the right place. So now all I got to do is go. So this is the uh, the portal, and then if you go SOTA state of the art, um, it shows you all the different areas of machine learning. Um, it's a really nice interface. It's got like, uh, you know, probably 50 different areas of machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, medical, AI, graphs, speech, games, uh, anyway, and, and audio, computer code. You can look, at, and then for each of these, it gives you a whole series of tasks. This is just five of them. They're shown here, but here in this case, there's 44. And then for each task, you can go drill down and find out what's the state of the art. Um, they, get, they give you the paper, and they give you the code. They give you uh, a link to the GitHub repo. So let's just drill down. Suppose we were looking at a nat natural language. There's 305 different tasks in NLP. Let's just look at question answering uh, for one of them. And um, so here's the squad 2.0 and the squad 1.1, which are the default project. Um, you can look at what are the state of the art, what what have people done on these, and what is, and you can even see their code. So um, this is a really interesting website. I haven't played with it too much, but it looks like a really useful website to to use. Um, are you seeing? Uh, by the way, are you seeing what I'm showing you now? The papers yeah. with code. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. I <laughs> wanted to make sure you were still. All right. So, um, yeah. So, any there, idea there why any... there's no papers there? Oh, any idea why there's no papers there? Um, For the well, squad says... 2.0 and the squad 1.1. Oh, let's have a look. Um, see all. Um, well, there's a GitHub repo right there. Um, so, so, there are papers. It's just. Uh, yeah, but that's a good point that uh, the at least going in, there didn't seem any papers there. But there's squad 1.1 and there's papers. Uh, there's squad 2.0 and there's papers. So yeah, there are papers on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Go back to our uh, slides. Um, any comments or questions so far? Get rid of all these windows. Um, there's got to be a better way to um, to have a desktop where you can organize what you're what you're doing without having to waste so much time finding your way. Okay, I'm back to the uh, slides. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing the slides? Yep. Okay, great. That's working. All right. So that's the uh, papers with code. Um, blah blah blah. Uh, and this is an interesting piece of advice. Uh, if you see a research area where many people are working. Uh, go somewhere else. <laughs> and that's interesting because, uh, you know, if, if many, many people are working on it, then there's lots and lots of competition and, um, and uh, you're not going to be able to do something. It's less likely that you're going to be able to do something unique. Um, okay, uh, what do you have, what do you need for some, for a custom final project? You got to have a data set and for NLP, it needs to have like 10,000 plus. Um, examples by milestone and here here they recommend setting a milestone at the halfway point of the time window they only have like a few you know a few weeks to do this project it's pretty amazing what these stanford people end up having to do for this class um so 10,000 plus label examples by the milestone time and probably more later on um you need a feasible task you need uh some kind of an evaluation metric um, for the case of the default project, I think it, there's a built-in evaluation method, the, the metric, the squad evaluation metric. 
um, and NLP has to be central to the project. I guess there were a lot of people who wanted to do, you know, projects involving uh, cross-disciplinary, like with uh, labeling uh, frames of a video, for example, and that would involve both uh, computer vision and NLP, but that's okay. And then some other people wanted to do projects involving reinforcement learning, but as long as it involved NLP, then that was considered okay. Um, okay, finding data, we already talked a little bit about that. Um, but he ends up concluding that the best thing if you're going to try to, if you, the best thing to do for your data set is to find, <clears throat> make use of an existing curated data set built by previous researchers. Um, in a small, in a project with a small timeline like the one in, like this class, um, you don't have a lot of time to build your own database and so on. <clears throat> and so this is the recommended thing to do is to find an existing curated data set that's already there. <clears throat> and then he gives some pointers as to where you can get these. Um, this is one place. Um, <clears throat> uh, University of Pennsylvania has a data set. Um, Stanford has their own um, data set, but I think it's proprietary to Stanford um, community members. So, I mean, I went to this website and find that you can actually ask for access to the data set. Um, and I just sent an email um, to them asking if I can access the data set, telling them I'm not a Stanford community member, seeing what will happen, but I don't expect that they'll let me access that, their data set. Um, so they have a lot of um, what they call corpora resources, um, uh, text data sets um, that you can apply NLP models to. So, um, and then here's another um, data set for machine translation. Uh, I mean, it's, sort of, it's a whole website which has uh, data sets that are suitable for machine translation tasks. Um, dependency parsing is something he really loves and um, because they've done some seminal work in that. And so they have uh, dependency parsing data sets where you can get data sets where you can, uh, you know, perform, perform that kind of uh, analysis dependency parsing. Um, and there's many more, he says, look at Kaggle, look at research papers, look at lists of data sets. And even now, uh, as I said, that was 2019, 2020, <clears throat> there will be even a different landscape with more and more data sets available. So um, looking online is, is probably the first thing to do or one thing to do. Okay, and then he has a little section of the lecture where he um, say, sort of takes another look at uh, GRUs and, um, and, and uh, LSTMs, which we already covered. Um, and he mentions the big problem with these data sets, with these, sorry, with these models is that they have vanishing gradients. They tend to have vanishing gradients. Um, and that's what, the whole reason why they had to, uh, had to move from ordinary RNNs to, uh, to LSTMs and GRUs. So, and the idea is that when a gradient goes to zero, you can't, you can't be uh, actually learning anymore in your, in your, uh, in your model. So here's sort of the, the standard diagram showing how when you're back propagation through a long uh, sequence of words, um, you, you have many, many matrix products and, and you end up, uh, you can end up, the, the gradient can end up vanishing. Um, and then he says, well, the solution really is to create shortcut connections, direct connections between uh, the latest word and the previous words. And that's actually what's, um, well, and then he says adaptive, adaptive shortcut connections, which I'm not sure what he means by that. But the basic idea is that, um, oh, okay, he says, let the net prune unnecessary connections adaptively. Okay, so some of the shortcut connections uh, might be pruned out. Um, then he, basically shows, he goes, reviews the equations for the gated recurrent unit and the, law and the LSTM, uh, which we already covered before. But the idea that he hits on is that the secret sauce in LSTMs and GRUs is that uh, rather than multiplying a long string of, uh, of matrices together um, to get from a word 
you know, to a word that's, you know, you know, 20 words earlier in the sentence, um, you make these skip connections, these direct linear connections between a word and some previous word. Um, and that's what he was talking about here back when he was talking about um, adaptive shortcut, uh, shortcuts, basically. The first idea about the shortcut, where you directly have a direct connection between the, the nth the nth word and the n minus one word and the n minus two word all the way back down to, to that word. So that it so that um, there's a way of getting around this vanishing gradient problem, because you have these direct sort of identity connections. And I didn't realize this, but um, this is also the, I mean, this is a really nice overview of why GRUs and LSTMs are so successful, in uh, com in combating the vanishing gradient problem. Um, and he points out that this is exactly the same technique that's, that was introduced in ResNets. And as you remember that from the past AI, that's exactly what they did in ResNets. They had these skip connections where they added, um, they basically added a, a, uh, a state uh, to, a, to an earlier state in the, um, or to a later state in the network. So that there were, there was always, you always had the previous data available as a way of remembering all the, all the previous data. So that's, that's that. Um, and he talks about this thing called the large output vocabulary problem. Um, so he says that going uh, in, in these, um, neural machine translation, neural language generation. Um, the main amount, the main um, you, uh, um, sink of your com compu computation power is computing soft maxes. And um, so the idea is, and, and this is over, and the denominator sums over all, all vocabulary words. So the main idea is to reduce your vocabulary to something reasonable. And they hit on, I think in this lecture, he says people have sort of gone to 50,000 words, although you could have hundreds of thousands of words in, in any language, but um, 50,000 words is, is workable, and that's what they've done uh, in a lot of cases. Um, word generation problem. I guess the biggest, one big problem in neural machine translation is um, there are unknown words. If you have a small vocabulary, like 50,000 words, relatively small, there's going to be a lot of words that you've eliminated that you aren't including. And then you have a problem when you have to translate those words. Um, you know, so one strategy is you can just, uh, you know, you're translating to, uh, I think this is uh, in, in French, um, translating English to French. Um, you just translate the, the unknown words to unknown words, and then you, you can just get a, a, a big confusion coming out. Um, I'm not sure what, he talks about ways that people are dealing with this problem. There, um, there's other ways than just straight translating an unknown word into an unknown word. Uh, there might be ways to get from context um, that word and maybe figure out what the translation could be. Um, so I think there are techniques to do that. Um, let's see. I guess we'll talk about this next, uh, next week. Um, anybody want to say anything about this who's maybe had some experience here? No? Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, machine translation evaluation. Um, so he talks about different evaluation techniques. Manual evaluation. They have scores of adequacy and fluency. Those are scores that they've developed sort of in the history of machine translation. And these are human... Uh, they're, they're derived from human evaluation. Um, I'm not sure what the definition of adequacy and fluency scores are, but you can kind of get an idea. Um, I mean, you kind of have a, an intuitive idea of what fluency is, that, that is ability to translate words correctly. Um, I'm not sure what adequacy is. Um, another way of evaluation is testing your, uh, your um, model in an application that uses machine translation as one component. <coughs> um, so uh, some larger task that uses um, machine translation as a subcomponent, and then you test the performance in that 
um, in that larger task. And the example he gives is uh, question answering from using foreign language documents. So you can see how that task would require machine translation. So the question is given in English. You have to translate the question into a foreign language um, and then ask that question of, you know, query foreign language documents uh, to try to get an answer. And then you have to translate the, the answer back. So that involves um, machine translation as a subcomponent. And so you could test your machine translation model in, in, a, in a larger task, in the context of a larger task like that. So that's one technique. And then um, the, other the third technique is use an automatic metric, uh, such as the, the blue score, bilingual evaluation understudy score. We've, we've actually gone over that a little bit. Um, and he reviews it a bit here. Um, the blue score, the blue evaluation method metric involves um, looking at um, the correctness of translation of n grams uh, when n goes from one through four. So one grams, uh, unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and four grams. Um, the, uh, each n gram precision score is between zero and one, and then you combine them um, in some way to include a brevity penalty. In other words, um, the shorter your translation is, uh, the, the more penalized you are. Um, but then he points out that people have gained the, get, have actually, they thought initially that it was a great evaluation metric and it would be hard to game. Uh, when they talk about gaming the system, he means finding a way to uh, tune the machine output so that blue goes up, your blue score goes up, but you're really not getting a better translation. Um, so this is the um, d drilling deeper into the blue formula. Um, so you have um, e to the power of one half times log of p1, where p1 is the um, unigram score, uh, plus a quarter times log of p2, where p2 is the bigram score, plus an eighth times log of the uh, trigram score plus an eighth times the log of the uh, four gram score. And it's interesting, this pattern, you know, a half for unigrams, a quarter for bigrams, an eighth for trigrams. I would have thought it would be a sixteenth for four grams, but no, they weight the four grams just as heavily as the three grams. I'm not sure why they do that. Um, and then there's this term that they subtract at the end, uh, the maximum of the ratio of the words in the reference document divided by the words in the machine translation. Um, minus one, uh, the maximum of that, and, and zero. And that is your brevity penalty. So, um, so let's see, if, the, um, if there are too few words in the machine translation task, then, in other words, if the machine translation has way fewer words than the reference uh, sentence, then this ratio is going to be large. Um, and it's going to be bigger than one. Um, so you subtract one from it, uh, compare that with, with zero. So if it's less than one, then that's good. Um, that means you, you've got more words in the machine translation uh, version than the original task. And if that's the case, then this thing is less than zero. This term is less than zero. And so you're, you won't get a brevity penalty. But if you have fewer words in your machine translation than in your, uh, than in your reference sentence, um, then you're going to end up with a, a, a positive brevity penalty that gets subtracted here. So that's how that works. Um, only words at corpus level, zeros kill it. I'm not sure what that means. Um, and then he gives a small example of, of that, uh, how that works. This is what he was saying that initially people thought that um, that blue was going to be really good as far as um, being consistent with the human evaluation judgments that you get from adequacy and fluency scores. So here he plots um, human judgments versus uh, NIST, uh, which is a variant of blue. And you look, and it looks like a straight line, a very you know a very good fit to a straight line. Um, and the human judgments are two kinds. One is the uh, fluency score, 
um, and the other kind is the adequacy score. And it looks like it tracks along with human judgments very well. The R squared is 88%. So, but apparently he said that recently people have learned how to game the system and they're getting really good, really high blue scores. Now it's routine to get blue scores that compete with human quality, that are human quality. And yet the, the uh, actual quality, if you go back and look at their translations, um, it remains far below human translation. So blue score is not the ideal way to, uh, to say that you have a human level. You know, it, it's not, the, in other words, a good blue score no longer means that it's comparable to human translation, even if it, even if it's, uh, even if it says that it is. So then um, he says there are new um, automatic scores that people have come up with uh, to replace blue. Uh, maybe they'll talk about them next week. Uh, but the point is, is that we have to have some kind of an automatic metric and probably people are going to use the blue score um, if you're gonna do a machine translation task. Um, okay, now he talks about like a, an overall top-down approach to designing your research project. Um, so this is kind of good for any kind of a, any, defining any kind of project, so it's good to go through it. First, you define the task that you want to do. Um, could be summarization, could be machine translation, could be question answering, whatever. Then you figure out what data set you're going to need. You do a search, um, some of those, using some of those uh, uh, resources that they mentioned earlier in this document. Um, you could define your own data. Uh, and then, of course, as we've already seen in many different contexts, you have to, the first thing you do when you go into your problem is you separate off the, the dev test part and the test. In other words, the training and dev data set and the, uh, and the test splits. Um, it's really important to do that. Um, you don't want to have any chance of contaminating your result with um, knowledge that was gained from data leakage from the test set. So that's really the first thing that one should do in a project is split off this um, training and dev set um, and, the, and the test set, which you never touch until the end, ideally, when you finalize your model and you want to see how well it does. Um, let's see, you define which metric you're going to use. Um, We've already talked about blue metric for a uh, machine translation, but you know, looking, reading the literature on your, reading some papers on your, on your problem of choice will give you an idea of what metrics people commonly use for those tasks. Um, and um, yeah, so you have to choose a metric definitely to, to evaluate how your performance is going when you, so that that'll help you building, building better and better models. Okay, um, he talks about establishing a baseline. Um, implement a very simple model, simplest you can think of. Um, compute the metrics, analyze the errors. Um, if the metrics are amazing and you have no errors, then uh, your problem was too easy and you need to restart. So this is a good way of, 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 of just seeing uh, if you've chosen a suitable task. Um, okay, next, once you have, have done this, then you implement your Neural network choice, neural network model of choice. Compute the metric on train and dev set. Evalu uh, analyze the output and the errors. Um, and I guess for this class, that's the minimum that you have to do. Um, then he says to to do better, um, you really need to get familiar as much as you can with your data set. Visualize it. Uh, get statistics on it. Look at the errors. Um, you know, look at the cases where it failed and see what, if you can find anything in common. Um, are there certain kinds of, ta of, of phrases or words or sentences that give, give your model a lot of problem? Uh, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, to analyze how different hyperparameters affect the performance. Every model has hyperparameters um, that you can tune. And the uh, standard way to tune the hyperparameters is to use the dev the dev set, you don't use the test set at all when you're tuning your hyperparameters. What's happening is when you're tuning your hyperparameters, if you spend a lot of time doing that on your dev set, um, you end up um, overfitting to the dev set. You end up finding out what are the best values of the parameters for that particular dev set and 
and that's not a good thing. So he even suggests that you might reserve uh, two dev sets. You play with your hyperparameters really intensely on one of them, but then um, when you narrow down your, your model and your hyperparameters, you go to the second dev set and start playing with them and playing a lot less than you played on the first dev set. So you have less risk of overfitting to it. Um, which I'd never heard that strategy before. I always heard of a train and dev set, but I never heard of a train and two dev sets. Anybody have any experience in that direction? I'm sure that Srinivas, you've had on your Kaggle um, uh, exploits, you've probably had a lot of experience with, with uh, train and dev sets and, and so on. Actually, more than that, uh, the, uh, I don't know how many people have already read it, but uh, Andrew Ng had a PDF that he published, it, which is still openly available. I think you just need to log into the and request it or something. And he talks in detail about error analysis in which he talks about, I think he calls it the test dev set or the dev test set, something mm -hmm. like that, which basically mm -hmm. helps you further analyze uh, the errors from your dev set and the common um, things to keep in mind to make the distribution of the dev set the same as the test set and when it's different, how to tackle it and so on. Um, it, I think that book is called Machine Learning Yearning. Is that the one you're yeah, referring yeah, to? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And really that, good. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've heard of it, but I haven't um, I actually downloaded it once, but I never actually looked at it. So that's a good. It's an uh, excellent reference for any kind of error analysis in deep learning. Super. Um, would you mind putting that on Slack so that people can can get to it afterwards? Sure. Thank you so much, Shrinivas. Um, okay, so uh, so now we're at the hyperparameter hyper tuning. Um, try out different, okay, so once you've got one model to work, and now you wanna try out other models and variants of that model. Um, and you wanna set things up so that you can go through, quickly go through many, many different models. Um, and, and find which one is the best. We've actually seen this um, sort of in another context. If you've been following the hands-on machine learning class, um, you know, on that end-to-end -end problem that we solved in chapter two, um, Jaron actually showed us how to set up a system like that in, in Scikit-Learn where you, um, you have a sort of a dictionary of models and then you just run through them in a loop, you know, you, um, you just loop through all the different models that you want to evaluate. Um, and in the dictionary, you set, um, you, um, let's see, you have a dictionary of models and then you can loop through the models and you can set whatever parameters and hyperparameters you want to set and just run through. And once you've got this thing set up, it's great because now you can just quickly see which kind of models are, are going to do better for you. Now, um, Language models um, are, at least in my experience, and I don't have a lot of experience, they're, they take a long time to train, so it's not so quick as the, as the exercise that we did in uh, hands-on machine learning, but it's the same idea. You wanna set things up so that you, you have to tweak only a few things and then, you can, and then you'll be running a different model. You, know, you, have, you, wanna, you wanna have a setup so that you can easily slot in uh, one model after the other and, and test it. Um, so you can get, I mean, and, and testing a model might take a whole day or something, but um, training a model might take a whole day, but you wanna be able to, to e explore different models and different um, model settings to figure out which one is best. Um, yeah, so that's that part. Now he talks about pots of data. So a lot of times you can find um, these publicly, publicly available data sets and they already have a trained dev test structure. Um, and he says that, you know, if they don't, you can make one, you know, you can, you can make your own split, you know, you can make your own, uh, suppose they only give a trained test structure um, or suppose they don't even split out the data. Um, you can do your own split you know, maybe take, uh, I don't know, 70% for train, um, you know, 20% for, for dev and 10% for test, something like that. Um, okay. 
you know, in fast AI and also, well, scikit-learn certainly has, and we're not using scikit-learn because scikit-learn is mostly for classical machine learning, but um, <coughs> scikit-learn has <coughs> a really nice <coughs> function called test train split. And fast AI has tried to uh, implement something very similar and even better um, where you can take in data in many different formats, whether it's in, a, whether the data is, whether the, um, train and dev and test sets are separated in different directory structures or whether they're uh, whether they're in uh, different CSV files or whatever. Um, FastAI has ways of, of uh, creating, of splitting out uh, train dev test sets. Okay. Um, the idea is you have to have a fixed test set that hopefully um, is the one you want to assess your model against. Um, but then he says, what happens, there's a problem sometimes if the test set turns out to have unusual properties that will distort the progress on the task. I'm not sure what that might be, but um, um, yeah, I'm not sure what that might be. Uh, one example is, is if you had, it, in a different context, is if you had, um, seasonal time series data, seasonal time series data, and you want to evaluate uh, on a set of data that occurs in some kind of an anomalous place in the year, like maybe Christmas season or something like that, and all you have is data for, uh, for one year, and all you have is data for previous uh, months in the year, and you're trying to evaluate it on during the Christmas season. Well, uh, if you have your train and dev data that's uh, through November, uh, you know, January through November, and then you're trying to evaluate on data from December, you're going to have a problem because the data, those data sets are not going to be uh, similar in a lot of ways. So I think that's what he's talking about here. Let's see, um, training models. Okay, so the idea about that he gives, and this is something that um, Jeremy has stressed also in the Fast AI, is that overfitting is not bad. In fact, overfitting is what you want to aim for at first. You want to for when you're doing with when you're dealing with neural networks, you want to overfit your data. You want to get uh, as close to 100% accuracy as you can on the training data, and then you back off and apply regularization techniques um, to make it to make it robust against overfitting, so that when you evaluate on a dev set, you'll get a a, a similar high score. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is what training a model looks like. Um, you can always train and train and train until you, your, training, um, your training error gets very, very low. But at a certain point, um, and this will be like number of uh, epics or something like that. And uh, at some point, you're going to reach your validation set. Of course, your validation error is never going to be as good as your training set. Um, um, and validation error typically evolves to decrease uh, just along with the training error. And then at some point, it reaches a minimum. and then things get worse. And that's what, in this part of the curve here, this is where you're overfitting. So for neural networks, this is fine because you can then back off and do and apply regularization um, and get the, uh, and, and get your model more robust against overfitting. So um, here is uh, his strategy that he offers. And, and I guess the machine learning yearning book would probably have a uh, Good pointers on this, as, as Srinivas says. But the idea is you um, you start with a training set, you do as well as you can on the training set. Then, if you have hyperparameters to tune, you you use a now he calls this a tuning set. Um, and then and then as you as you do this, th so that so you're going to intensely use this data set to tune hyperparameters, um, and then you measure progress as you go on a dev set. So as you tune up your parameters to a and you think you've got a good model, then you measure your progress on a dev set. Um, and you would keep coming back to this dev set, but only a few times, only a relatively few times compared to the number of times you would use the, the tuning set. Maybe you would uh, use the tuning set for all your different models and their different hyperparameters. And then each time you've sort of built a great model, uh, tuned up the hyperparameters, then you'd go over to the dev set and measure your progress. Then you'd go back and take a different model, uh, tune the hyperparameters on it, and get a good model, and then come back to the dev set and evaluate your progress. Um, so this way, the devs, this dev set doesn't get used a lot of times. So 
it becomes hard. So you're sort of insulating yourself against overfitting to the dev set. Um, so you're kind of using it as a touch as a touching base data set that that almost kind of like you would like to use your test set, right? I mean, uh, if you're building a model and all of a sudden you've got everything uh, tweaked up and you're really excited that it's working really well, the impulse is, oh, let me go try it on the test data now. Um, and but if you do that too many times, he says that's just human nature. But if you do that too many times, you're basically using the test set in such a way that you are starting to overfit. You could start to overfit to the test set. So he says, instead of using the test set, you use this little dev set, um, which you come back to again and again, but only a few times, like each time you maybe tweaked up a model. Um, and he even recommends <laughs> that sometimes if, you, if you're really uh, eagerly using this dev set to test many different models, you might have to get a second dev set. So it's kind of like a complicated strategy, but the whole idea is you do not want to overfit to the specific data sets that you're trying your model out on. Um, and only at the end, you want to use the, uh, the test set. Um, in a purely, if you're doing a pure, uh, a really principled and pure approach, you, you would never use the final test set until you have your final, final, final model. Never use it at all. And, and you only use it once when you evaluate your final model. And he says that in practice, people sometimes don't do that, but his recommendation is just make sure that you, in other words, you know, you've got your final, final, final model, um, then you try it out and you get some, some great results, but then you go to sleep and you wake up and you had a dream and you're, uh, you found a way that you can tweak your final, final, final model to make it even better. So then you go back to the, you want to go back to the test set and do it again. And that would be sort of violating that stricture. So he says that in practice, sometimes, you know, it happens, you know, because sometimes, you know, you come up with a better way with a way that you hadn't thought of to really improve your final model. And now you have to use the test set again. So he says that happens, but make sure it doesn't happen that many times. And that way you'll be sure not to overfit, not to tune your model to the test set. Um, and on Kaggle, as um, people with a lot of experience on that know, um, they keep a private test set so that, you know, if you try, if you try your Kaggle model again and again and again on the test set and, and make it better and better and better, um, you know, you're at risk for overfitting on that, on that test set. Um, and so to get your real evaluation score that Kaggle uses, they keep a private test set that you never get to see. Uh, and that's how they make sure that you're not just overfitting to your, uh, to your test data. Um, okay. Um, train, tune, dev, and test sets need to be completely distinct. You don't want to have data leaking from one to the other. Um, one common problem is uh, that they haven't talked about too much, but I've sort of uh, heard about it, is that um, you could have, and your test set could have, if it's, could have duplicates from your training set that you don't, and if you don't look for them, then you're going to be in trouble because you'll, uh, you know, if you tune a model that does well in the training set, uh, it might also do well in the test set because of those duplicates. So one thing to do when you're building a model, this goes for any kind of model, uh, including tabular, maybe even more, especially for tabular models, um, is to look for duplicates in your test set before you, uh, before you uh, run your model on it. Because if there are duplicates in the test set that are also, also in the training set, uh, then your performance is not going to be estimated correctly. Um, let's see. So here's what we were talking about before. Uh, if you keep running and running and running on the same evaluation set, you sort of use that data up and you overfit to it. Um, and so that's why he recommends, you know, tune dev and even dev two tests uh, uh, sets uh, that you use to, to build your final model, and then a firewall between those data sets and the test set uh, that you you never use the test set until the end. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, <laughs> I like this. He says, getting your neural network to train, that's especially a problem with um, language models, I think, uh, any kind of neural networks. Neural networks want to learn <laughs> because they're designed, you know, using stochastic gradient descent. So if your network isn't learning, then you're doing something to prevent it from learning successfully. So that's an, a positive attitude to have.
Um, then he mentions that lots of things can go wrong, causing your neural network not to learn, not to train. Um, debugging and tuning phase can can take more time than implementing your model. So you have to sort of anticipate that and not get too frustrated when that happens, if and when that happens. Um, and it's hard, he says. Um, experience, care, and rules of thumb help. Uh, let's see. Um, models are sensitive to learning rates. Learning rates are the hyperparameter, one of the hyperparameters uh, in, in, in neural networks. There, there are other hyperparameters, but learning rate is probably the most important one. And uh, so Karpathy sh uh, made a point in his CS231 class that um, learning rates can really affect how well your model performs. If, you, mo if the learning rate is too high, you've all, you've all seen these things where you have like a parabolic um, loss, loss function. And if your learning, learning rate is too high, then you're going to be taking steps that are too big and you're going to be bouncing back and forth between the walls of your, of your, uh, of your minimum. Um, if the learning rate is too low, it's going to, it's going to climb down the hill, but it's going to take forever, you know, to climb down the hill and you'll train very slowly. You'll eventually get there, but it might take weeks, you know, <laughs> and you don't have weeks. So um, if you get the uh, learning rate just right, then you'll have a, an ideal kind of a learning curve like this one. Um, models are sensitive to initialization. So um, he shows the classification accuracy with uh, two different approaches. Um, one approach, the orange or the gold approach, um, climbs up in accuracy very quickly, whereas the older approach uh, gets the same accuracy but takes a lot longer to do that. Um, all right. Um, Training a gated RNN. So he says use an LSTM or a GRU. Although I think in these days, um, we're probably going to, if you were doing a, an NLP project these days, you would probably want to use a BERT, some variant of BERT, which, is, um, atten which uses attention. Um, talks about different optimization techniques. Adam, add a delta. Clipping, gradient clipping, that helps to avoid gradient uh, explosion, uh, exploding gradients. Um, use only dropout uh, vertically or can be using Bayesian dropout. Bayesian dropout is something interesting. I haven't looked into it, but that, that sounds like an interesting technique. Um, optimization takes time. Um, okay. This is uh, interesting um, when he talks about an experimental strategy. Um, this kind of like goes over what Jeremy, uh, so, some things that Jeremy all, already told us in Fast AI. Um, start with a simple model, get it to work. Remember, Jeremy started with uh, uh, um, you know, the simplest kind of models and then uh, progressed to more, more complicated ones. Like if you're using ResNets, you, know, you could start with a ResNet 18 instead of a ResNet 51. <coughs> um, Add the bells and whistles, make the models more complicated um, step by step instead of just trying to throw in everything in your model and then all of a sudden and expect it to work right away. Um, the other thing Jeremy told us already is that you want to run on a small data set. Um, and remember, he made the uh, 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 image net or whatever that was, a, a, a more compact version of the internet data set. Um, but this is even more extreme than that. He talks about using eight examples. Um, and sometimes using your data that you make up, um, your own data. Uh, and he said, make sure that you can get 100% on this small data set. Um, and if you can't, uh, get 100% on a simple data set by overfitting to a simple data set, uh, then your model is not powerful enough or broken, something like that. Um, the next step after you're doing that would be you're running your model on a large data set. Um, and you still want to get, you still want to overfit. You want to get a score of close to 100% on the training data after you optimize. Um, if you can't get 100%, uh, then you want to try a more powerful model. Um, again, we mentioned this already, and Jeremy's mentioned it. When you're doing deep learning, overfitting is not bad. So don't be afraid to, to overfit. It says that even when you overfit, the models are good at generalizing, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
but even so, so, so he says that sometimes when you overfit to the training data, you still can get a good performance. It still generalizes well. But he says that in general, you want to, um, uh, to, to get good generalization performance, you want to regularize um, using some kind of uh, regularization like L2. Um, and he says that in neural networks, the secret sauce is um, using dropout. And by generous dropout, I guess he means even a high fraction of dropouts. I've seen like 25%, maybe even more. Uh, let's see, look at your data, collect summary statistics, uh, look at your model's outputs. Yeah, that's like you, you want, <clears throat> again, this is something that Jeremy uh, built into fast AI, like when you're doing uh, image classification, for example, he had, uh, remember he had this procedure that shows you the most confused, the examples that your model got most confused on. Um, you could actually bring up a number of images that your model got classified the most uh, terribly. And then you could actually look at those images and figure out what was wrong with them. And in some cases, you know, you're trying to classify animals and your images are, are, are teddy bears. So that would be something, that you're, there's something wrong with your data set um, and you, you might want to fix it before, uh, by somehow trying to eliminate teddy bears. Um, And then he mentions that the hyperparameter tuning phase is really, really important for um, neural networks. So yeah, um, you look at your model's outputs, which, which um, in the case of an NLP, what kind of text are you doing the worst on? Um, and try to figure out if that's something wrong with your data set or if there's something in your model that can be improved to do better on it. Um, right up. He says, look at last year's prize winners. I guess they have this all on the um, CS224N website. Um, so that's, that's the end of this one. Um, for any of us who are considering um, starting or, particip or are already participating in a project um, involving NLP. I'm, and this is of course optional. A lot of people don't have time to go through this, uh, go through the project phase, but if you do have time, it's definitely recommended. Um, okay, so I guess I'll just ask for questions at um, this point. At the start, you said that we wouldn't be doing the uh, class project or whatever. Um, yeah. I just looked at like the schedule that you have for for these meetups, and I saw like the, the last five weeks or whatever are sort of project discussions. What I what had you in that. mind? For this I, just kinda, I just kind of threw that in in case some students decided now some some learners decided to do projects. I can imagine that among the a class this big, we might have a few people who either have uh, have projects that they want to you know that they worked on uh, and they want to present. So I just sort of built a little bit of room in the schedule for that. All right, it's just like yeah, like when I saw that, I thought that maybe you were intending to um, do this class project, like maybe do the sort of the default project that they had in mind. That would be an interesting thing to do if, if one had time. By the way, I should mention yeah. that we have a couple of, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that was it. Really, I was just wondering, were those five weeks intended to try and do this, this class project? Um, we could, yeah, that would be good. I mean, I, I would be up for that. <clears throat> um, anybody who just wanted to get through the material, the technical material in the class can, can leave at that point and, and other people can stay and work on projects. That would be that would be fine, and uh, yeah. Um, I should also mention that there is a spin-off group um, uh, called NLP underscore projects that's run by um, uh, Darren Pluchok. Um, and that's kind of a very loose informal um, group and he's got actually a number of, of spin-off groups from that. Um, there's like an encoders and a summarization. So there are people working on their own projects, um, but it's kind of independent from this from this class. But if you're interested, you can look in, into those Slack groups. Um, I haven't been following them particularly closely in the last couple of weeks, so I don't know what they're up to. Um, anybody, uh, I, I notice among us, there are some people who are in those groups. Anybody want to give a report on what their group is up to on in the, either the embedding group or the one of the projects groups or the summarization group? 
I think Dinesh, I think you're involved in some of those. That's correct, yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, the project group, there are three subgroups. One is um, summarization, which is, um, I, I think that's led by Abhijit, he's, he's present in this meeting. So that um, initial work has been done by Abhijit uh, on it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was more to do with the, I think, uh, uh, get the PDFs or big documents and get it down to summary. That was, uh, again, the initial work was done. So I, I, I don't know much about um, that, that, that particular group. And again, uh, we're going to have a meeting right after this, I think in 45 minutes. So everybody's more than welcome to join to get the status of each, um, each area. And then I would advise everybody to come in. I think I was away for a couple of weeks. So I, um, I joined only yesterday, but all in all, as you said, there are three groups. One is for a summarization. Um, and the idea is, um, anybody can come up with any project and then anybody can join in to, uh, do the project together. Uh, another, another pro, uh, project was like starting from a fundamentals, uh, doing the work to back. Um, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that group is almost, um, th there isn't much happening on that side. Uh, no momentum in that group. Is it, is it, is which one is that? Is that the uh, encoding group or? No, the fundamentals. Oh, fundamentals. Okay. So there are some, so there's, yeah. there's NLP underscore projects, there's NLP underscore encoding, and there's NLP underscore summarization those are the slack groups that are currently active and dinesh you're just saying that the nlp underscore um fundamentals group is kind of petered out they're not really yeah very active so, anymore. yeah there is there isn't much we uh, haven't seen any meeting or mm -hmm. like no, uh, there, there is no progress and there is no actual project which is happening on fundamental side so it's, mm -hmm. uh, i think it's a good idea for perhaps like in this from this group if anybody wants to join in and come up with the idea and work on any small small enough project for this um, for this course uh, i think we can join in and can start working on that uh, towards that and third one is which is the nlp embeddings so that is more to do with uh, working uh, working on an actual project and there is some progress on that side so mm -hmm. uh, one of the guy edger he works for an organization, some charity organization. I don't re uh, remember the name. Uh, however, it's called the modern. It's called the Modern Slavery Project. Correct, correct. So he has provided the, the data. Uh, so the data is there. Uh, if anybody wants to join in, they can join in. So data access will be provided by him. And then again, these are like a documents where all the companies are making a statement what they are doing towards uh, or how they are avoiding this modern slavery. So again, it's an exploration side, what um, the project itself themselves can do as far as the, the um, modern uh, slavery is concerned. Again, yeah, and, the, and uh, just to be clear, the, the modern slavery, what they mean by that is um, sexual trafficking of young children and so on. That's correct, yeah. So these are the three, and then NLP project is kind of like a, uh, everybody get together together, which is the meeting at uh, in 45 minutes, where um, all the three uh, guys from all the three different subheads will meet, and then discuss uh, discuss what they are up to, and if anybody wants to join or any new ideas. Having said that, I think um, the this project is quite open. Uh, Anybody can come up with the idea of a project and then uh, other people can join in to see um, how, how they go ahead. And the, the, the whole idea is doing a more on a practical part. So uh, that's, 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 uh, that's the update. Uh, but I would, I would advise everybody to join in in the next 45 minutes to hear, listen more about uh, what the embedding group is up to and then probably get us some idea about the summarization. Great. Um, thanks so much for the update, Dinesh. That's really useful. So, Steve, um, if you're interested in a project, uh, in doing a project, um, there's a, a good place to jump in in, those, um, in that NLP projects group. 
Um, I know that you're involved in the in the Kaggle group, so you're not going to be able to attend it. Um, but you can still um, sort of tune into what they're doing in the Slack group and see if there's anything of interest to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly over the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to do the homework there, the assignment for homework for, for this mm -hmm. class. Yeah, that's uh, something yeah. I got to do too. It, it's a bit of a challenging homework, but like it, yeah. it does sort of um, clarify everything. And so, yeah, it is a, a good way to uh, put into put into practice everything we've been learning here in this class. So um, so a, a project or whatever is like a, an even better way to do that. And I, I thought like the default one that they talked about, the the question answering thing sounded like a, a reasonably interesting project. It does like actually, almost, yeah. yeah if does. they've used that last year, then there's maybe sort of a lot of information about it as well. So yeah. 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 So keep that in mind, everyone. Um, we, you know, even though we're not, the op project is optional, but if you have the time and inclination, it would be a, a great thing to do. And we will, um, as Steve reminded me, we, we do have time at the end of the um, of the course uh, to work on projects uh, if you're so inclined. So we will we will make that a part of our uh, study group. All right, um, I think we're we're done. Unless anybody else has any um, anything they want to bring up. I want to ask. Uh, this is Winchon. I want to ask. Um, Hi, Winchon. Uh, something about the NLP um, papers group on um, because I feel like that group has so much potential um, but I mean I only attended one session um, but it seems like it wasn't involving codes but and we got this great papers with codes uh, website and perhaps mm -hmm. we could even do some papers with codes um, just like combining you know not only reading the papers but also like uh, implementing some codes uh, with the papers. Uh, so anyone from that group and still attending sessions uh, have any updates? I, I can update the, about that group as well, Wenqing. So basically, um, we haven't met uh, in that group um, for the last couple of weeks. Okay. And um, your suggestion was taken on board. Uh, Arshad is leading that group, and then I think he's working on a one of the paper LSTM. Um, mm -hmm. Supposedly, that paper is quite big, and then he says he said uh, he has to go through all the maths. He likes to go through all the maths behind the practical bit. So yeah. uh, we, I think, there was only one meeting in that group. Uh, there is possibility that next Thursday we'll meet. However, there is a okay. one potential challenge in that group is that uh, nobody else is taking a lead or ready to prepare um, any yeah. any paper. So that's what I think um, more and more people will take uh, responsibility of one paper maybe uh, in a week time. So uh, I think that will work, uh, That then we'll get some pace in that, that group. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's another group to watch. I'll, I'll make a list of these groups and post it on, on our Slack group. But basically, we have a bunch of groups that start with NLP underscore, and these are uh, groups that you can watch for activity and that are that's related to uh, things that we're interested in. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, anyone else? All right. Let's.